Testing, testing. Good evening. Well, good evening, everybody. I think we're on time, and I only got one good evening, so I'm going to have to keep asking until I get a good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, like I told you this morning, we're just going to go service by service, and uh, we're going to come up with a little bit of a plan this next week of uh, our, our music going forward. But tonight, uh, Brother Levi was preaching. It's, it was his normal, normal time to preach, and I was going to do the music, and uh, we didn't get linked up on the music, so we're going to sing just us tonight and that'll be okay if you're online just plug your ears for a little while if you got to but I picked out some songs and some of them I mean none of them is brand new songs they're hymns but I went through and tried to pick out some that would be easy easy to sing without music and this is one here that we've all heard with our kids and I, maybe it was you guys that I told but I figured out that there is more than one verse to Jesus loves me did y'all know that I didn't know that. There's four of them. And uh, I thought the Gaithers added the second and got fancy, but it turns out there was four from the start. And I, I just didn't know. So tonight we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. And um, we're going to sing, it, and it's, we're not going to sing the, the song, I mean the, the verse, then the chorus every time. We're going to sing a verse, a verse, then a chorus, then a verse, 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 and a chorus. So all the, all the words are up there. You just follow along. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work just fine. Ben, you're going to have to work with me good. I, I get lost. We lost now. 
Before we get to singing, let, let's pray and just ask God to meet with us in our service, then everything we do will be uh, worshipful and pleasing to him. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the time to get to meet with you and, and uh, sing songs of praise to you, Lord. We have such a mighty and awesome God to, to sing about, to praise. And Lord, we just ask that you would meet with us tonight. We know you come with us, and Lord, we just want to worship you and, and, and be pleasing to you that all is said and done. Help the singing to be glorifying to you from our hearts and to have true worship. And, Lord, you just bless Brother Levi with the words that we need to hear. Lord, fill him up and uh, uh, allow him to just break down the word that you've given him tonight. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, let's start on the, on the first. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Jesus loves me, thee who died. Heaven's gates are open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Now, it's going to sing three of them before we sing the curse on the second one, okay? Just stick with me. I, I, I was trying to be smart, and if I mess it up, you tell me afterwards, all right? Jesus loves me, loves me still. Though I'm very weak and ill, from his shining throne on high, comes to watch me where I lie. Jesus loves the children dear, children far away or near. They are safe when in his care, every day and everywhere. Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure and holy thine. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. All right, you guys follow along pretty good. I learned some things about Jesus loves me. It also doesn't say for the Bible. It just says the Bible. But I think we'll be out inserting a four right there. It just seems right. This next song, I know y'all know this, but I believe it's 1 Timothy 1.12. Uh, Paul was talking about things happening to him and, and what is going on in his life. And he could take it. He told Timothy... For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have given unto him against me, against that day. And I just messed up some words in there, but you know what I'm talking about. Paul knew who he trusted in, and he believed, not that just Jesus loved him, but that he could trust him with everything. And I'm glad tonight we can sing this, and uh, it, it'll be more of a, a traditional approach. There'll be a course after the verse, so... Uh, just be prepared for that. But y'all know this, so let's sing it together. I know not why God's marvelous, wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which 
I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith with him. But I know whom I have believed in, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I love having good music, but I got to say, I like hearing every one of you guys singing. And uh, don't worry, I can't judge. I can't hear you over myself singing. But it's just good sometimes just to hear singing. I really like that song, and I was flipping through the book, and it's probably not the same old red book that some of y'all have told me about, but there's a red book, and it says Baptist hymns <laughs> down in the office. And I was looking, and I seen several several hymns and that one stuck out to me because I started reading it and of course I remember we've sung it several times over the years and I'm just glad that we don't have to understand everything about how God does things. Uh, here lately I heard a man preach a message and it was about salvation and he said salvation is like an iceberg. We see the top of it. We see the tip. We, we experience it. We, we, and we see what we can see, but the undergirding of it, what was bought for our salvation, how he opens our eyes to salvation, how we believe in the, the things of, of, of the, that God works in our salvation to save us. And I'm glad we don't have to understand it all. I'm glad we don't have to. It's really, really fun trying to figure out as much as we can as far as the Bible says. But I'm glad we can just know who we believe. So that song, I hope, hope you enjoy that. Um, I, I guess we don't have to have a welcome I done said, hey, <laughs> and we're here, and I hope you guys had a good afternoon. Go ahead to the next one there, Ben. Uh, and then we, we know this song <clears throat> very well, so we'll sing Redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. All right, that's three. And I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I ain't supposed to preach when you're leading music, but every one of them make a fellow happy, won't it? I ought to make a lady happy, too. And I, I'm just glad, no matter, I, I, I like all kinds of music, and I find the same message and so many other things. Sometimes working in the, I say, the, I call it the shop because it makes me feel good about it, but it's our garage. <laughs> 
at night on some wood projects and I get earphones in and singing and sometimes just have a time at who we worship and who our God is. And this song just sums it up and then we'll let Brother Levi come preach. Um, this is just this, the song that you know. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Through every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in him be found, Dressed in his righteousness alone, Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All right, brother. That's all we got. Come, come bring it to us. Once again, I do appreciate the opportunity uh, to bring the word to you tonight and uh, pray the Lord will be with me as I give you the word. I uh, got an idea of uh, something that I wanted to speak on and um, started studying it and it was one of those classic uh, times where what I thought going into it is not at all what God ended up pulling out of it. Um, so uh, hopefully you will enjoy it as much as I did uh, when studying uh, this passage that we're going to be in tonight. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to Mark chapter 7. <clears throat> Mark chapter 7 is a story that we probably uh, read or, or heard preached before, uh, but we're going to look at it again tonight because uh, it is a good one. Uh, and the title of the message, as you can see there, uh, is going to be, What is Your Expectation? What is Your Expectation? So if you would, uh, look in your Bible with me, Mark chapter 7. We're going to be starting in verse 31. And we're just going to read the whole passage, and then we'll go back and we're going to break everything down a little bit. But in Mark chapter 7, verse 31, it starts off by saying, and again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came into the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseeched him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to the heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And so when I read this passage, uh, when I was studying... As you see here, the people brought the deaf man with the speech impediment to Jesus. And as I was reading this, the thought that came to my mind is that they brought this man to Jesus with an expectation, right? And that expectation was that they wanted to see him healed. And you might say, well, why? Why did they want to see him healed? And 
Unfortunately, we don't have an answer. Was it for entertainment purposes? Did they just want to see a miracle? Did they see, want to see something supernatural or spectacular happen? Uh, or did they really care for him? Did they know this man? Was it a personal relationship? Or they knew that he just needed a savior and they brought him for those reasons. The Bible doesn't tell us. And unfortunately, we're kind of faced with that same predicament still today, right? Uh, do people come to church because they love God and they care about others? Uh, and, and where they're going to spend eternity? Or are they just coming to church um, so that they can be entertained by big, fancy, flashy music or uh, a preacher who can tell a really good story, you know, behind the pulpit? Um, we don't know. Um, but I would hope and I would pray that it's genuine care and concern for a lost and a dying world, right? And that's the stance that I, I want us to kind of look at this from, uh, today and assume is that they did care about this gentleman and that's going to take us hopefully into our message this evening and so let's say a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll look at these scriptures lord we praise you and thank you so much for this time you've given us lord to just study your word i pray that you would just bless this passage lord as we go through it lord help us to see uh what you've shown me uh, in your word lord that we can uh See something about what our expectation is and what it should be, Lord. Just bless and be with this time. We ask and pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing to note tonight when we are mentioning an expectation would be the question, can you bring your expectations to God? Can you bring your expectations to God? Because the reality is, if you're not a child of his, that's not going to happen. Um, if we look in the book of uh, Romans, let's see if I can get this tablet to cooperate here. <clears throat> in the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, it says this. So then they are in the flesh, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ... He is none of his. If you jump down just a few more verses in verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We could just say the children of God. And so that question, are you a child of God, is really the first thing that we have to ask. Because in order to be a child of God, you have to believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to take away your sins. Right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It makes sense that as a child of God, we would bring our petitions before him, right? We would ask him for the things that we need, and most likely sometimes the things that we want. But we would do that because he's our Heavenly Father, and there's a relationship there with him. Um, I know there's probably an exception here or there. Uh, somebody would say, oh, I'm not embarrassed to. But typically you wouldn't ask, when you're growing up as a kid, you wouldn't ask someone else's dad for something. You would ask your own father for something, right? Um, and so it goes to reason that as a lost person who's not a child of God, you wouldn't think to bring your expectations to him, right? And so the first thing that we want to make sure is that can you bring your expectations to God? Do you know him? Are you a child of his? If you've never asked God to forgive your sins by placing your faith and trust in him and in the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for you, today is a perfect day to do that. Perfect day to do that. And there's no reason whatsoever to wait. There's no reason whatsoever. All it takes is realizing that you're a sinner and that there's nothing you can do to save yourself, and that God sent his only son strictly for that purpose. Jesus came and he died on a cross for your sins. And you accept that as the payment for your sins. You accept his sacrifice. And he died and was buried, but because he's God, he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And he is alive today, sitting by the right hand of the Father. And by putting your faith and trust in him for your salvation, that, that's it. That makes you a child of his. That faith and that belief and that trust alone is all that's needed. And then once you have that, then your expectation can be eternal life, right? Your expectation can be joy and love 
and hope and more than what this sinful world has to offer. Amen? And I believe, by most of the testimonies that I've seen, that that would definitely be the case uh, for the majority of those of us here at Gwinnett Hall. Um, I believe that we have members that do love the Lord. They have been saved, and they have a heart for Him, and they have a burden for the things of Him. And as children of God, we know that He loves us, right? We talked about it this morning in Sunday school. One of my favorite Bible verses, Romans 5, 8. It says, But God commended His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we get that, and we understand that love, and we want others to know about that love also. Um, we pray and seek out and witness to those who, who might not know Him, right? We strive to do what He tells us in the book of Matthew with the Great Commission, where He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so because of that desire and those, uh, the love that we have for Him and those commandments that He's given us, we, we try to do things, right? We plan events uh, like VBS or we take time out to ask God in prayer for Him to send people or give us opportunities for us to share His Word and love with other people. But then in lieu of how those things play out, what should our expectation be, right? Right? And so that's kind of where I want us to look at next is what should that expectation be? If you look back with me at the very first part of verse 33, I noted this when I read this story. It says, and he took him aside from the multitude. So the man that had the problem, Jesus took him aside from everyone else. So in my mind, I don't know, it, this is probably silly, but I picture like the disciples like making this wall. Like, give him space, back up, back up, you know. And uh, I'm sure that's not at all how it happened. He probably just told Mark the story after it was said. And he's like, Lord, what did you do? And then he told him, and that was it. But the point that I wanted to make with this is that don't always expect to see what God is doing. Don't always expect to see what God is doing. It says Jesus took him aside from the multitude, so the people weren't able to see what Jesus was actually doing. And I believe many times... God may not need us to know His plans while He's working. Amen? And, and if you're like me, that, that's a hard pill to swallow. I like to know what's going on. I like to have my organization. And uh, I know there's people that aren't like that. I got a, a brother that's not very like that. You know, you go on vacation, he's kind of fly by the seat. Well, we'll just get up in the morning and see what we want to do. And I'm like, no, we need an itinerary. I need to know what's happening at every single point in time, but it's okay. I think I won because his wife is kind of like that instead. But my, I want to know. I want to have an idea of what's going on. But that's not always the way God wants us to, to have things work out. And I think it's because it, there's a really good likelihood that if we knew what his plans were, it is inadvertently in our nature to want to change them we would most likely want to change them. And two examples came to my mind, and one of them you'll call me petty for, but I was watching a certain superhero movie the other day. And in this particular movie, you're getting down towards the end, the bad guy's beating up on the good guys. It doesn't look like they're going to be able to win. And one of the good guys looks to the other, and he says, look, we can win. We have one chance, and we can win. And so his partner tells him, well, what is it? What do we got to do? He says, no, I can't tell you. If I tell you, then it won't happen and we won't win. So they're good, good partners. So he trusts him, you know, goes all the way through the end of the movie. You get down to the very last end. They got to beat the bad guy now. And there's only one move left in order to beat him. And it turns out that the way that they beat him is by that one superhero sacrificing himself for the good of everybody else. And there's that one moment where he turns and he looks at his partner and he kind of looks at him. It's like, we got one shot. And he realizes in that very moment, if I don't sacrifice myself, everybody else dies. And so he makes the ultimate sacrifice and he saves everybody. But the reason that his partner didn't tell him was because, you know, if he had told him, well, you know, we can win, but it'll involve you killing yourself. 
You think he'd have went along with that plan? He would have probably tried every other plan in the book that involved him trying to win and staying alive. That's why he couldn't know. I give you another example, and this one's extremely petty. But if you're like me, it's not for the sake of knowing where to go. Sometimes it is. But I use my GPS all the time. I got to go somewhere. I pop it in my phone. I'm going from work to church. I want to see what's the traffic like. Is it going to be backed up? Do I need to go this way, that way? I'm trying to see what the best route to go to where I want to get to is. Is there a wreck? Is there construction? That type sort of thing. Most of the time, it's not that big a deal. It's, you know, run this route and you'll get there. And GPS gives me one route, the fastest route, the quickest route, most fuel economy route. And you know what my nature is? Well, you know, I bet if I took this other road right here, I could probably cut five minutes off of that. Innately, I'm questioned in my phone. It doesn't care. It's not a competition. But my nature is to think that because it's telling me one thing to do, I bet I could do it a different way. I bet I could do it better. And so, silly as that is, I give you that example because if God was to tell us what his plan was, if he was to divulge everything to us in lieu of what we've prayed for, chances are we would try to do something that would mess that up. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, you guys have heard it before, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And that's what we have to be okay with. Don't always expect to know what he's doing. Instead, we take that approach of trusting him and doing what we've heard and read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? I'm sure most of us here could quote it. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And so we, we realize that we may not always see what God is doing. Our, our, we don't expect to always know exactly what is in the works and what is unfolding. So you say, okay, well, I got it. I may not see it. What, what should I expect then? And our next point would be expect God's presence to touch you. And don't expect to stay the same. Look with me again in verse 33. It says, And he took him aside from the multitude, and he put his fingers into his ears, and he spit, and he touched his tongue. And looking up to the heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were open, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. Because the deaf man was willing to be in the presence of Jesus, Jesus touched him in such a way that he was forever changed. And so our, my challenge to you tonight is a question, really, is are we willing to be in the presence of Jesus? Are we willing to be in the presence of Jesus? And this actually ended up coinciding with, really, really well with our Sunday school lesson this morning. Um, because when I say, are you willing to be in the presence of Jesus? You say, okay, well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, one of them would be this right here. And that's one of the things we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Was God speaking to us through his word? Are you willing to read his word? Are you willing to read what he's given us? And... <clears throat> When we looked at it in Sunday school, I, I took the, the verse and added it to my message this afternoon. 2 Timothy uh, 3 and 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Are we willing to be in the presence of God? Are we willing to read his word? Are we willing to talk with him, basically, is kind of what that I feel like that boils down to. But, but then are we not only willing to read his word, are we willing to study his word, right? Are we willing to study his word? Because I can have a conversation with somebody, but it's kind of like Brother Jody said this morning. He can have a conversation with Dr. Deems, and Dr. Deems can give him scripture, and he can read that scripture and go, okay. Or he can study it. He can actually find out 
what does this word mean? What does this Greek word mean? What does this Hebrew word mean? What was the context in which this was said? And there can be such an understanding and a clarity that's given. And when it comes to our lives, the word of God is like that. We also read this morning, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We get in the word and we read it and we study it and he talks back to us. That presence of the Lord starts to come and dwell with us. That's what we want to be doing. We don't have an expectation of knowing exactly what he's working on, but we let him come and work on us. And Brother Jody's message fits straight in with this. Are we willing to worship him? Yes, it can be with music. Of course, it can be with music. But are we willing to worship him with our time? Are you willing to clean? Are you willing to make food for somebody? Are you just willing to talk to somebody? Brother Jody had a prayer request for us this morning. Young gentleman that he, you said you met at the gas station, I think it was. There had to be a conversation there in order to know that there was a need there. So maybe it's just as simple as a conversation. But willing to, to do things for the Lord in His name for His honor and glory. Praise Him with prayer. Just have that conversation and talk to Him. But are we willing to be in His presence so that He can come and dwell with us? Because if we'll let Him dwell with us, like the Scripture showed us here, I believe He'll come and touch us. And we won't stay the same. You say, well, that, that doesn't, I don't know that I'm down with that. You know, change, and nobody likes change. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, you're probably right. Because when we look at the scripture a little bit more, uh, in verse uh, 33, it says, And he put his fingers into his ears, and he spit, and he touched his tongue. I made a note to myself. It said, it might be a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but one of the worst moves that I hated that kids would prank you with when I was growing up was a wet willy. Do not come towards my ears. If you do, we are going to fight. I didn't enjoy that. It wasn't a comfortable experience. And here, this gentleman had Jesus sticking both his fingers in his ears. And I'm sure that was awkward and weird and uncomfortable. But... When we study the word of God and that uncomfortableness comes that we read about, that, that piercing asunder of the joints in the marrow and him knowing the intents of our heart, yes, it's likely he's going to show us things that make us uncomfortable, but that is how we will be better for him. Knowing who we are and knowing what it is that we have to watch out for, knowing what it is that in order to be the best I can be for him, I've got to make sure I'm following him with to the T with scripture and with my life and with what's around me. We are better for knowing those things. I was listening to a message earlier this week and the pastor was talking about a gentleman that he knew that had a problem with sexual immorality. It was just something that he struggled with. And he made a note that this man found a way to deal with this. He, he didn't magically get healed from this problem because he still has flesh, right? But he asked the Lord to help him, and he asked the Lord to do things that would cause him to not be able to give in to this temptation. He said, I'll tell you, that friend almost never goes anywhere without someone with him. He has accountability. And that accountability helps him stay righteous the way that the Word intends for him to be, the way that Jesus wants him to be. And studying and reading the Word and letting the Holy Spirit use it to talk to us is how we find those kinds of things out. So we're willing to stay in the presence of Jesus even though it might be uncomfortable and even though, also, we might not understand everything. In verse 34, it uses the word, and I'm probably saying it wrong, but it's an Aramaic word. It says, Ephetha is the way it's pronounced, which means be opened. But when you look at this, it was an Aramaic word. And as we know, the New Testament was written in Greek. 
It wasn't written in Aramaic. So, of course, Mark translated this here um, because otherwise they wouldn't have known what the language meant. And I don't know that the gentleman, you know, he was deaf, so I don't know that he understood what Jesus was saying either or anybody that might have been in earshot distance. So when we serve Jesus, it's almost certain that sometimes we may go through things or periods of time where we don't understand, right? And we're not sure what it is or why it is that we're being told something. It may not make sense in the moment, but in due time, if we will, I use the phrase here, stay by the stuff, um, he allows us to see what the purpose is or was. And he gives us understanding that might not be for just our benefit, for, but maybe for someone else's too. How many times have you been through something and it wasn't easy and it was hard, but then a month or two or maybe three months later down the road, all of a sudden there's that friend that's in the same situation. They're in the same predicament. And you're able to not only just be there for them as a friend, but give them good biblical advice because you yourself went through that same thing and God brought you through it on the other side. So we're willing <clears throat> to stay in the presence of Jesus even when it's uncomfortable, even when we don't understand. And by doing that, if we are truly spending time with God and striving to be more like Christ, we won't stay the same. Uh, we were having the conversation at uh, lunch today uh, about those that we've seen get saved and how they completely like 180'd when they got saved. Because that's what the true power of God does in somebody's life. And even if you've been saved, it's the awesome thing about that inspired living word that we were talking about earlier. When something is living, it can impact you, right? It can cause things to happen. Dead things don't cause action. Dead things just lay there. They're dead. But something that's living, it's moving, it can have an impact. It can cause motion. It can cause things to happen. And so we study this word and we stay in the presence of Jesus and he impacts our lives and he causes a change in us so that things aren't the same. Our speech is different. Our actions are different. Our motivations are different. I thought of the example, I, right now everybody's kind of big on uh, baseball, right? It's the season. Everybody's checking out their team and watching what they're doing and how they're doing. And if that is what you're into, then chances are your speech is going to be about that. It's going to be about the game that your team just played, and it's going to be about the teams that are at the top and maybe a couple of teams that are way down there at the bottom that you didn't think would happen. And your motivation is is going to be to see them do good and hopefully acquire a ticket to go see a game in person, right? And your actions are going to be different because what you're doing is towards the motivation that you have to go see that game. And it all kind of ties together, if that makes sense. But when we find ourselves in the presence of Jesus and we're willing to be in His Word and studying His Word and worshiping Him and praising Him, then all of a sudden those actions become different. Those words that we have are the words that we've read from him we end up talking about. We do things like help out at a vacation Bible school and we see someone get saved and then all of a sudden that motivation is different because, oh my gosh, someone came to know Jesus. I got to tell somebody else. Who else can come to know Jesus? And the action of what we're doing is different. I mean, if Brother Jody just led someone to the Lord the other week, does it not make sense that he's willing to talk to whatever stranger was at the gas station this morning? It makes perfect sense. And so we stay in his presence in lieu of seeing him touch us in such a way that we don't stay the same, just like the way when he healed this man, he didn't stay the same. And you say, okay, Levi, so what if I understand? I may not see the immediate work of the Lord. I get it. Uh, and I am seeking him and I am letting him work in my life uh, until my future expectations in him are fulfilled. If I'm already doing these things, then, then what else you know, is there to do? Great question. I'd love to tell you. Look with me in verse 36 and 37. It says, And he charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And they were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. 
He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. You say, okay, well, he told them not to speak and they spoke anyway. Well, in lieu of that, the last point that I want to give you tonight is share what he's already done and share your future expectations in him. The people were excited to proclaim what Jesus had done. I'm sure it was spectacular to see. But we should be excited to proclaim what Jesus has done for us as well. Um, Hopefully he has saved your soul from an eternal damnation in a place called hell. And that's definitely something worth praising him over. Amen? We go ahead and we praise him for what we have now in lieu of whatever that expectation is of him in the future. You look at some of the things that have just recently taken place. You say, well, we were going to have a a vacation Bible school, but some ended up getting sick. So, no, we didn't get to have vacation Bible school. But have you stopped to think about the fact that we caught the sickness in time that we did? And we didn't have a vacation Bible school in which so many people could have got sick? See, God's still good. And maybe it's possible that one boy or that one girl who needs that salvation message of Jesus Christ. That wasn't the week for them to be here. It's the week coming up that it's their time for them to be here. We can't see God's plan in all that, but why in the world would we mess that up? And there's so much that we could continually be praising him for and sharing about the Lord in lieu of the things that have happened or played out the, the way that we didn't expect, we strive to continually thank Him and praise Him for what has happened and what is currently happening for us today. And this is the thought that came to my mind because I'm sure my praise is different from your praise. I don't know what your praise would look like compared to mine. If y'all want to all hang out after service and have a praise testimony, I'm down. But if we're not praising Him now for what He's done and what He's doing, Why would he give us something more to praise him about? Now, don't don't get me wrong. I realize God God is better than that, right? He's way better than that. He is not that kind of God. Um, That that would be petty of him. But the point is there to still reason. If I wouldn't praise him for my salvation, if I wouldn't praise him for the wonderful Christian family he gave me, if I wouldn't praise him for the wonderful church family that he's given me, for the talents that he's blessed me with, Why in the world would he give me something more? What evidence does he have that I'm going to praise him for that? And so that's our point. Are we sharing what he's already done? Are we sharing those future expectations that we have in him? Because the way it played out in my mind is kind of, I guess you could say they're a little bit of, it's a little bit of a harsh question, but are we asleep or are we awake? Are we just existing Or are we actually living like we have an expectation in a God who is fully alive and coming to get each and every one of us that are his one day? Amen? So the big question is, what is your expectation? What is your expectation this evening? I hope that there's something in there that has been encouraging to you uh, and that if for any reason your expectation wasn't what it should have been. Maybe the Lord's helped show you something different uh, in lieu of that tonight. The last thing I want to do is I'm going to play a song for you um, that the Lord put on my heart. I guess this is kind of my way of uh, praising Him, even though I have already done that a little bit today. Um, But this is a song I wrote back in a time where there was a little bit of doubt and there's a little bit of confusion and uh, didn't know what direction He was going to have me go and Uh, He ended up giving me this song, and then it was a couple years later, he kind of gave me a remix to it, I guess, if you want to put it that way, and uh, added a little extra in there to it as well. Um, So I want to play that for you in just a moment. Um, But I guess right here, Brother Joel, if you would just say a prayer for us, and then we'll have a song.
And this song is called The Music I Can Hear. The music I can hear, the rhythm is not clear. The song I heard is gone. I need the strength to carry on. Lord, please help me find your way. Give the notes that I should play. Let the spirit draw in near. Help me listen with my ear. So the music I can hear. Trying every single day to make sense of your way. Lord, I know you have a plan. And I'm willing to go, I'm willing to take your hand. So let me be your instrument, instill in me the music I can hear, the rhythm make it clear, the song to be so strong, the strength to carry on. Help me find your way, give the notes that I should play. I let the spirit draw in near, help me listen with my ear. So the music I can hear, the music I can hear. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy hands have made well I see the stars and I hear the mighty thunder thy hands throughout they have made then sings my soul, well, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Give praise to you all the day long and pack my life in such a way that people hear you when I play. The music I can hear, the rhythm make it clear, the song to be so strong, the strength to carry on. Help me find your way, give the notes that I should play, let the spirit draw in near, help me listen with my ear, so the music I can hear, the music I can hear, the music I can hear, how great that Let's pray one more time. Lord, I thank you so much for tonight. Just thank you for your word, Lord. Pray that you would help us, uh, that we would have our expectations right with you. I just bless and be with all those that are here. Give us a good week. Uh, help us to come back Wednesday. We'll praise you. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that, brother. Does anybody have a birthday this next week? I guess I shouldn't admit it. I got one. Uh -oh. 
Friday. I'll be 32 years old. <laughs> no, Brittany's getting close to 40, but I'll just be 38. Uh, oh, goodness. We'll be 38. Anybody else? Well, we'll get Deanne next week. And Deanne's will be next Sunday. I guess so. it's just you. I reckon so. I should have just hushed. You had it going on. <laughs> All right. And the one and two. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. I don't really know this chords of that song if you can't tell. Hey, I told him when he was winging it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all stand. Thank you guys for being back tonight. Um, I hope you all have a blessed week. Find somebody. And uh, find somebody this week. Ask God to show you somebody to tell about Jesus. Some way. You said, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how much to say. Just say Jesus to somebody. See if you can get that out this week. And tell somebody about him. And then, Lord willing... Uh, we'll meet back on Wednesday night for our prayer meeting. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for this day. Thank you so much uh, for the fellowship we got to have with your children today. And, and Lord, uh, um, the dedication and, and singing and preaching. And what a great day in your house. And we just ask for your blessing upon us as we leave this place. That we would go with boldness and courage to, to have the right expectations of, of what you're going to do in our lives. To, to free us just to be available for whatever you would have us to do. Lord, please use us this week for your glory and honor. And we ask it all in your name, Lord. Amen. We'll see you guys Wednesday.